Hi, I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist from PsychScene. Welcome to another edition of Hub Bites. Today I'll be taking you through the effect of psychotropic medication on the QTC interval and QTC prolongation, the effects of medications such as antidepressants and antipsychotics, which ones increase the risk of QTC prolongation, and strategies for the management when we identify QTC prolongation. So let's get started. The QT interval on the ECG is defined as the distance from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Now this is generally calculated by the formula known as the Bazitz formula. Now most ECG machines calculate the Bazitz formula for you. However, there are some issues here because the Bazitz formula is calculated as the QT divided by the square root of the RR interval. The issue here is that it overestimates the QTC interval at higher heart rates, such as greater than 60 beats per minute, and it underestimates the QTC interval at heart rates less than 60 beats per minute, so when you have bradycardia. So as a result of that, the recommended formula is the Friedericius formula. Now this particular formula uses the cube root of the RR interval. So the formula is essentially QT divided by the cube root of RR. Now this formula is less influenced by the extremes of heart rate. So certainly something to think about when you have a prolonged QTC identified and you're thinking whether this is clinically significant or not, have a think about the Friedericius formula. Now, what are the values in milliseconds of the QTC interval that we should take into account? Now, the QTC, as you saw earlier, is corrected for the heart rate. So the C stands for the correction for the heart rate that's done. Now, the QTC interval, the normal QTC interval in an adult male is 430 milliseconds, less than or equal to. In adult women, it's less than or equal to 450 milliseconds. A borderline QTC interval in adult men is 431 to 450, whilst in females it's 451 to 470. A prolonged QTC would be considered to be greater than 450 milliseconds in males and greater than 470 milliseconds in females. So that's when we've got to think about a prolonged QTC and the risks associated with it. Now, the main risk of a prolonged QTC is torsade de point, which literally means twisting around points. Now this is a form of ventricular arrhythmia that can be fatal and that's the key risk of a prolonged QTC interval. Now what we do know is that a QTC interval greater than 500 milliseconds is associated with a twofold to threefold higher risk of torsade de point and each 10 milliseconds increase contributes to approximately a 5% to 7% exponential increase in risk. Now the QTC interval is essentially a combination of cardiac depolarization and cardiac repolarization. We know that cardiac depolarization is due to a net influx of sodium ions, whilst a cardiac repolarization is due to net efflux of potassium ions. So what is the pathophysiology of a prolonged QT interval? Medications that block the HERG, which is a specific gene associated with the potassium channel. It has a funny name, which is known as the human ether, a GO-related gene of the potassium channel. It actually produces a repolarizing current termed the delayed rectifier current, resulting in a longer action potential and therefore a prolonged QT interval. Now, there are a number of risk factors that are associated with QTC prolongation. The reason why this is important is because in clinical practice, when we have a number of these risk factors prescribing medications, we need to take into account that they may actually prolong QTC. And what are they? Cardiac vulnerability, such as a congenital long QT syndrome, or previous history of QTC prolongation. Therefore, family history is important. Cardiomyopathies, ischemic heart disease, etc. So any cardiac vulnerability can be associated with QTC prolongation. Medical conditions such as acute stress or shock, acute infection or systemic illness, starvation or anorexia nervosa. Medication-related aspects such as drug toxicity, medication combinations, 
any intravenous medications that are associated with QTC prolongation, we've got to be cautious about, and metabolic aspects such as hyperkalemia, hypomagnesemia, or hypocalcemia. And of course, female sex, females are more likely, female sex is a risk factor, and of course, extremes of age such as children or the elderly. We've also got to be mindful of medications that can prolong QTC interval. We know that in psychiatric patients, there may be a number of medical comorbidities that might be present, such as diabetes, hypertension, infections may occur, and therefore medications such as antibiotics, erythromycin, clarithromycin, etc., we've got to take into account. Antimalarials, chloroquine, mefloquine, quinine, are associated with prolongation. Antiarrhythmics, and of course, other medications such as cyclosporin, amantadine, methadone, tamoxifen. So let's look at antipsychotics and QTC prolongation. As you can see right at the top, so you can see that it moves from the higher risk, lower risk at the bottom. Right at the top, you have thyridazine, pimozide, intravenous haloperidol, and from a second generation antipsychotic perspective, ziprasidone is associated with the highest risk of QTC prolongation at approximately a 16 millisecond increase from baseline. Whilst the safer antipsychotic medications are at the lower end, and you can see amongst the second generation ones, aripiprazole, paliperidone, acenapine, and lurasidone are the ones that are considered safer from a QTC prolongation perspective. The meta-analysis by Stefan Loix, which is on the right-hand side, you can see lurasidone and aripiprazole right at the top as safer antipsychotics in the context of QTC prolongation. So just something to think about in terms of antipsychotic choice in clinical practice. Here is another table that is looking at antipsychotic medication QTC, and it's the same concept um, outlined in a table format. What you can see right at the left-hand side, the ones that have very low effect or, or, or rather no effect or negligible effect are lurasidone, cariprazine, and brexpiprazole, whilst a low effect is aripiprazole, acenapine, and clozapine. But as we move towards the right-hand side, you know, high effect, where we've got to be very cautious, is any intravenous antipsychotic, pimazide and certindole, right at the top in terms of QTC prolongation. Now let's look at QTC interval and antidepressants. And here, as you can see, tricyclics are right at the top. Desipramine, doxepin, and trimipramine. Of course, imipramine lower down as well. And you can see the numbers are, you know, in, the, in their sort of at the lower end of the spectrum, sort of uh, 8, 11, but at the upper end of the spectrum, almost a 20 millisecond increase from baseline. But what is important is commonly used antidepressants, two of them, two SSRIs, citalopram and escitalopram. And it is very important for clinicians to be mindful that as the doses go up for citalopram and escitalopram, that the risk of QTC prolongation increases. So for example, for a citalopram at 60 milligrams, the mean increase in QTC prolongation is approximately 18.5 milliseconds. Whilst for escitalopram at doses of 30 milligrams, it's approximately 10 point seven milliseconds increase. So just something to think about and recommendations are that QTC intervals to be monitored when prescribing citalopram as citalopram at higher doses. Having said that, it is important to carry a risk benefit analysis and that you know one doesn't stop um, the medication suddenly because of this prolonged risk. We'll look at management because the risk of depression and of course the consequences of depression also need to be taken into account. Whilst when you look at the safer ones right down at the bottom, and of course on the right hand side as well, we've got the, the, a number of names, but you've got mirtazapine, bupropion, venlafaxine, sort of at the lower end of the spectrum. Whilst on the right hand side, you can see some of the newer uh, medications such as vortioxetine, velazidone, nefasidone, agomelatine, levomilnasopran, these are considered um, safer from a QTC interval perspective. So let's look at what do we do when we are faced with QTC prolongation. Now the first thing is of course take into account risk factors and we are able to calculate a risk score based on these risk factors. 
Now, there are a few algorithms such as the risk path algorithm. Credible meds is a useful source to identify medications that can increase QTC prolongation. So you can definitely have a, uh, a visit uh, to those uh, two credible meds. Now, when we look at risk factors, for example, you can see there are a number of risk factors in bracket, you've got a risk score. So you can calculate a risk score based on that. So let's look at what happens if the total risk score is less than two. If it is less than two, no baseline QTC is needed. But if you've got a total risk score greater than or equal to two, that's when you check ECG prior to the start of medication or start a lower risk medication, which is essentially a medication that is associated with QTC interval prolongation risk of less than 10 to 20 milliseconds. Now, if feasible, check ECG in less than three months. Now, if the risk score is less than five, obtain an ECG in two to four weeks if they're already on psychiatric medications. While if the risk score is greater than or equal to five, consider urgent or emergency cardiology referral. So this is important because liaison with the cardiologist at this stage is important, particularly if medication is going to be prescribed that can increase the risk because as you can see, the risk score here is greater than or equal to five. Now, three options come up here. As you can see, if the QTC interval is less than 450 milliseconds in males or less than 470 milliseconds in females, which is you know, the upper limit of the prolonged um, numbers, start the medication and repeat ECG in two to four weeks. Repeat ECG when the risk factors change or in, when you're increasing the dose by 30 to 50% and assess risk factors annually. Now, what would you do if the QTC interval was greater than 450 milliseconds in males and greater than 470, so at the upper limit of the prolonged um, interval in uh, both sexes? Now, here, the torsade de point risk is intermediate. Ensure that the chosen medication has the greatest benefit to risk ratio. Check potassium and magnesium. Repeat the ECG in two to four weeks. And finally, if you've got a QTC greater than 500 milliseconds, and it's also important here, if you've got sometimes a jump from a baseline of greater than 60 milliseconds, this is when, of course, we've got to have a much higher in index of suspicion for the risk of torsade de point and, of course, the consequences of that. So here you can see that torsade de point risk is high. Check potassium and magnesium. Consider dose reduction or switch to alternate psychiatric psychotropic medication with a QTC prolongation risk of less than 10 to 20 milliseconds. Repeat the ECG in two to four weeks and consider a cardiology referral. So I hope that this gives you an overall perspective on prescribing medications in um, psychiatric patients and particularly thinking about their heart and their QTC interval and that this management algorithm can help you put in place a management plan and liaison with your cardiologist if you identify QTC prolongation. So take care, stay safe. I'll see you in another edition of Hubbytes soon.